Good afternoon. Um, very, very warm welcome to this masterclass on the wines of Saint Chignon. I'm Patrick Schmidt, editor in chief at the Drinks Business, Master of Wine, um, and it's it's great fun to be back again, talking into a camera uh, for a masterclass that is entirely virtual. I'm sorry about that, but it's not long before we'll be able to see each other in person. Um, and actually, I think we've learned a lot through this pandemic about how to deliver these educational classes, uh, which I think we'll retain. So I'm hoping in the future we'll be able to do a mixture of live events where I can interact with people, uh, see whether you're smiling or yawning, and also be able to beam things to people who can't get into central London or wherever we hold these classes. So actually, I think it's a good thing, but it's not long now before we can do things and shake hands and share a joke. Um, but for now, while it's virtual, um, I'm going to introduce you to Saint Chignon. Now, um, you may have noticed, or hopefully you've noticed, that the masterclass is called Rediscover the Wines of Saint Chignon. For some of you, it may, may be that uh, it's a pure discovery. You don't know the region very well. But um, I chose that name um, for this particular educational event because it seemed to me that there was a rediscovery process happening for perhaps the longest standing members of the wine trade because Saint Chignon used to be, uh, along with some of the other appellation, appellations within the Languedoc, very prominent on the UK supermarket shelves. Uh, the likes of Fitou, Corbière, Minervois, and Saint Chignon uh, were quite commonly found in the likes of Tesco, Sainsbury's, wherever, and prominently so. Um, but in more recent times, they've been slightly sort of sidelined. Yes, there is still a you know a wonderful Tesco finest Saint Chignon, for example. Um, but I suppose the kind of the march of, of certain very fashionable areas have kind of eroded into the shelf space for Saint Chignon. I'm thinking of things like Argentine Malbec, um, perhaps Chilean Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, New Zealand Pinot Noir, or Rioja. So what I'd like to do today is rediscover Saint Chignon um, and hopefully persuade you why it's worthy of another close look. And of course, you know, since the 90s when it was very popular, I would have said that the winemaking has also moved on. And the reason, uh, the way in which I hope to encourage you to look more closely or look again at Saint Chignon is through a kind of four part um, element. So we're going to start very briefly with the history, then I'm going to look at the regional characteristics, uh, the soils which are very important to this story or the geology, and then finally uh, the wines, um, the proof of the pudding being in the eating or the tasting in this case. So hopefully you will have your samples and we shall taste through them together uh, and you can draw your own conclusions. Um, just very briefly, really, on the history, I just want to stress the fact that this really is an ancient uh, part of the winemaking world. I think that's that's very important to the character of Saint Chignon. Um, if you've been there, I've cycled through the area. Um, it is a stunning historic place uh, with Roman um, remains, ruins, and uh, it's just an incredible landscape. But the vine actually arrived in uh, France via the, the Languedoc, this, uh, this area, through the port of Narbonne um, and worked its way northwards through the country. So this is really the, the first uh, vineyards and winemaking took place in this part of France. So it is truly ancient. Um, Greeks, 5th century BC, then the Romans really developed winemaking to, in, in a bigger scale. Um, and actually the vineyards of Saint Chignon um, are kind of traced back to the 8th century and Benedictine monks um, and the village itself takes its name from a canonized monk called Saint Agnon. Um, but I think it's also important to know that actually, you know, if you look at the wider Languedoc region, um, the areas where uh, vines, uh, wine growing really flourished was in places like Saint Chignon because it was a higher altitude, rugged, rocky, sloping uh, um, sites where really nothing else would grow. So it was perfect for vineyards. So an ancient history. Um, this is not a new place for winemaking. It's not a new terroir that's just been discovered. Um, as for the appellation itself, Saint Chignon uh, gained its AC status in 1982, uh, and that was for red and rosés. And then whites came along in 2004, uh, and also these village designated kind of crew for the region, the Saint Chignon Berlou and uh, Roquebra. Um, and it's one of the earliest. 
um, appellations, AC, uh, regions of the Languedoc to, to be granted AC status, Fitu being the first in 48, and then it was before other famous places like Corbière and Minervois. I also think saint Chenier. we're not looking a lot at this, but there is one in there and you'll see it and, and try and hold off drinking it. Well, I don't mind if you want to taste it now, but we'll taste it together shortly. There is white wine in saint Chenier. It's quite prominent for whites. And I think that's really exciting because I think the whites from the Languedoc is something that certainly a little bit newer to me and I think they're very exciting and these kind of slightly kind of rich oily but fresh styles of white wine based around grapes we're going to look at like Grenache Blanc, Roussin, Marsan, Vermentino roll down in this part of France. Um, so really interesting there and saint Chenier is a good place for whites and I think that says a little bit something about the terroir here as well you know high altitude rocky a little bit cooler fresher um, and windy good for whites and rosés. Anyway, reds are the dominant. Uh, it's about 3,000 hectares. <clears throat> a lot of these facts you can look up, so I'm not going to dwell on them too much, but I've kind of tried to put them into perspective to you, for you. Um, 240,000 hectares are farmed in the Languedoc Roussillon. So it is the largest single um, wine vineyard in the world and the most diverse. And Saint Chenillon is just a tiny part of that. Um, but it does, it is diverse, it is quite fragmented, 90 independent wineries, 8 cooperatives, some very good cooperatives in this part of France, uh, and 80% red, 75% um, sold domestically, and there's a list of the AOC villages in the region. Some of those names will crop up when we look at the wines shortly. Great varieties, uh, kind of looking at GSM blends here in saint Chenillon. Um, Carignan, Sanso, uh, this other little known grape, I don't think there's any of the wines today, Lerone Pelou, which is a kind of mutation of Grenache Noir, a sort of um, hairy Grenache, I suppose. Uh, it's got furry undersides to its leaves, which are good for preventing evapotranspiration, kind of naturally well adapted to the um, to the dry, um, harsh climate in this part of the world. Whites, Grenache Blanc mentioned, Marsan, Roussin, Vermentino, and then some other grapes there is allowed up to 10% and maximum yields of 45 hectares per hectare. But we're looking, if, it, it, earlier when I mentioned Roman winemaking in the region, they were working with these grapes uh, and also Tempranillo, Sensibel. Um, but this really is, you know, this is harking back to the historic grapes of this part of, of France. In fact, this kind of area around the near the Pyrenees and uh, that uh, near the border with with Spain, you're looking at uh, at this selection of grape varieties being dominant over over the centuries. Um, and where are we? Okay, well, this is I hope a map that that provides a bit of a clue. Um, down there, you can see the little dot. Uh, that's the Languedoc area down in the south of France. And then that's a more detailed map showing uh, saint Chenillon itself. But essentially we're kind of, um, it nudges up into the base of the Cévennes mountain range, the, the, the kind of end of the massive central. Um, so if you went beyond saint Chenillon, you'd be in an area where, where really you, nothing could grow. Uh, you know, there'd be no pasture, there, there'd be no vines, maybe a few olive trees, but essentially it's too rugged and rocky. Um, and then beneath it are the kind of plains towards Bézier. Um, so, um, and, and it's kind of, it, it faces the region, is, is, is a sloping region that faces the Mediterranean. Um, and in terms of other appellations within the Languedoc, it's between Fougère and Minervois. So Fougère to the um, to the west, uh, sorry, to the east, and Minervois to the um, to the west. Um, it's it's dramatic landscape. It's a fantastic part of the world. Rugged. It's dry. It's windy. It's famous for Garrigue, that kind of collective term for the herbs, the kind of tough mountain. Um, herbs that can thrive in these Arab, arid conditions. Uh, and then, of course, there are the, uh, the vines. But that's the backdrop of, of, of the, of the Saint-Chinien region, those beautiful um, peaks of the Cévennes. Um, and the climate is typically Mediterranean. It's, uh, it's mild winters, very hot, dry summers. It's really you know, it's a period of drought that'll last up to five months. I mean, there's no rainfall at all. It can be pretty punishing. Um, and I mentioned earlier wind, I mentioned it in, ref in uh, relation to the white wines, the roses. It's one of the windiest parts of the, of the Languedoc and I think that's really important, or it is really important, to the style of the wines. Um, that Tremont Tremontaine, the uh, wind that comes from the north, brings a coolness, particularly at night time, uh, so they're quite big diurnal temperature swings. Uh, it's also very important for um, 
for the for the kind of health of the vine that wind that uh, sometimes cool but dry winds uh, keep the vine very healthy this is an area that's ideally suited for low intervention viticulture and organic winemaking um, very little need for for sprays and certainly in terms of the soils uh, there really shouldn't be any need for herbicides except for cost cutting um, soils now this is really important and we're going to discuss a bit more but this is key to the uh, the character of Saint Chignon um, and that's because it's got two very distinct soil types uh, the schist and the calcare or the schist and the limestone um, and the schist really being very important to the story and, and it's been very become very important to the story of Faugere if you know the neighboring, neighboring um, appellation to Saint Chignon which has made a big a lot of noise I suppose in kind of niche wine circles about schist and its effect on the wine style well you, you've got a lot of schist in Saint Chignon as well um, what you've got really is, is a split 50-50 and the more northerly part of Saint Chignon the more rocky higher altitude areas are schist based and then the southerly a clay and limestone again fantastic viticultural so soils um, it just perhaps I suppose a little bit more common um, and there's some discussion we're going to look at this as to whether there is a, an overarching wine style that it can be related or correlated with the underlying geology so uh, Jancis Robinson um, in um, the Wild Atlas of Wine and also in, 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 in various other books has referred to uh, the fact that the vines in saint Chinia grown on schist produce sharper wines and those grow lower down on these, on these well they're red, even purple clays and limestone um, around the village of saint Chinia on itself are softer. That's her view, we'll look at that shortly. But a bit more on this topic. Um, in fact I was reading a little bit about it and it was a point that actually I must credit Andrew Jefford um, for, but he'd done an interview with, with some prominent growers or a tasting with some prominent growers in saint -Chignon, and they'd let it slip really that early on the INAO, which is the body that kind of governs all the, all the rules relating to regions, winemaking regions in France, um, had felt that actually saint -Chignon, so it split 50-50 schist and limestone clay, that the schist area of the Languedoc should all be united, so Faugère and also Cabriere, which neighbour saint Chignon, should get together and become one appellation for um, those vineyards grown over schist-based uh, schist soils and that sort of geology. Um, but this never occurred, it was kind of blocked by the winemakers of saint Chignon, who rather than coming up for a strict uh, region defined according to its, uh, its soil type, felt that the uh, the region was uh, had a wonderful unity uh, and cohesiveness based on the community of winemakers that was stronger than uh, than than the soil the influence of soil types so they resisted that further delimitation um, and I think that's a nice story because it shows um, how strong the regional the sense of, of regional cohesiveness is and the fact that it transcends uh, soil types um, and there's another aspect as well is that some of the merchants who blend wines from across Saint Chignon um, like the fact that you could choose, let's say, Grenache or Syrah grown on schist, and then a style that came from those lower lying clay and limestone sites and create. Um, a, a blend that I suppose was better than the sum of its parts. They were complementary wine styles that blended well together. Um, and I also make another point that there is in fact an organisation for winemakers called Terroir de Schist um, who make uh, wines from schist soils and that doesn't just uh, stretch beyond the borders of Saint Chignon but France um, as well because there are lots of other well there are a few other places in the world that are famous for wines grown on schist uh, not mentioned there but the Douro being one and Portugal um, and then there are places in the Loire, Savignier, Alsace, Corsica um, and also parts of Switzerland so there is in any case an organization to to tell that story or bang the schist drum um, but Saint Chignon has really it's come up with this logo, and I, I just put this slide in here, but if, here's the promotional bit, but it's their choice, and I think it's a good one. Um, they want to promote themselves around this dual character, so the, the fact that the region is split and you can have wines from schist and calcaire. 
and what's interesting is that when you look at those soil types uh, it also relates to slightly different landscapes I mentioned the more rugged uh, character of the schist uh, more northerly area of, of, of saint genion um, but also the vegetation type as well and you can see there in those slides the right hand or the the bit slightly lower to my right maybe your left is um, is the clay the sort of red clays you can see with the olive olive trees um, is there a real difference between schist and limestone when it comes to wine style well we're going to look at that loosely it's not a terribly rigorous experiment for lots of reasons one because we haven't tried we haven't done wines from the same producer grown on different soil types they're not identical blends not identical winemaking um, and neither have they been in in past tests but but i mentioned andrew jefford he did do a tasting um, with the producers of saint chignon trying to compare as closely as possible like with like um, so not blind but let's say it was a Grenache from the same vintage sometimes the same uh, producer or made in the same way grown on a limestone soil uh, with a Grenache um, on a schist soil and he drew some conclusions and I think it's important to share them with you here which I have done because it's something that's important to the appellation and it's something that the growers really believe is is very clear to detect even for you know the layman the wine drinker um, color schist based uh, wines whether it's going to a little bit darker aromatics not as fruity the schist more about I suppose minerality if I dare use that word uh, but more about the kind of um, uh, more about the structure of the wines I would say than over fruit um, and aromatic characters he talks about the limestone soils giving a bit more kind of stone fruit and also a little bit more reductive characters and the schist is a bit more dried fruit I certainly noticed that in these wines one of them I noticed just note almost a little bit like Amarone slightly raisined pruney um, and then some of this earthiness smokiness smoked meat carrots you often get with Syrah I sometimes see that with the um, Syrahs from schist based soils a bit more spice um, his feeling was that the varietal character so whether you could clearly taste whether it was a Grenache or a Syrah was clearer in the wines with uh, grown over limestone so perhaps we can draw from that conclusion that the schist the character of the rock uh, the influence of the soil was perhaps stronger in that uh, more northerly part of Saint Chignon where the schist dominates um, a little bit more on, on the flavours um, he felt that the schist had a bit more uh, intensity um, and that could be to the fact that the schist based soils not as wet and not as rich as nutrients maybe they're lower yielding so that could explain it and I've mentioned the pruny meaty and spicier uh, uh, characters crushed stone um, and the schist was more about as he said tannin in rock he also said that the limestone showed more garrigue they talk about in that in in the good wines of the longer dock this character of the kind of dried herbs and I've noticed in some of the websites that people talk about the uh, the wines grown on the on the limestone clay soils being more typically longer dock in style and by that I wonder whether they're referring to that character that people talk about kind of dried herbal note um, I've put in my own thought here that I wonder whether some of the characters that people are uh, ascribing to the schist soil type could be because of the effect of those soil colors and water retention and other factors on the grapes so a darker schist um, holds a bit more heat and then uh, re-radiates it at night that could be a, con a connection with slightly higher alcohols as well I noticed in the schist based wines uh, also perhaps a longer growing time harvested a bit later in these higher altitude um, sites on the other hand lower yielding more concentration so there are lots of factors at play um, acidities I think this is important that's a slide there showing what the, the schist looks like um, but I think acidity is interesting um, generally even though the schist is a lower pH higher acid soil type it yields wines that are a little bit um, lower in acid and limestone the opposite so a higher pH lower acid soil uh, but producing a wine with higher acid 
and lower pH. So a little bit confusing, but I think you do associate limestone soils with fresher styles of wine. So that might be a, a way of, of remembering it. And in fact, the schist, the, uh, the nature of the tannin, the dryness of the tannin, and maybe that mineral crushed rock character means that they do give a per perception of freshness, even if the acidities aren't as marked in terms of analytics. Um, and that really is just summing up that point in this slide that the schist soils, that despite being high acid in themselves, you saw that slide earlier where the schist soil had quite a lot of pine growing on it, uh, quite a tough place to grow things, high acid, uh, free draining, uh, low nutrient soils, and they tend to give those slightly higher pH wines, so lower acidity, higher pH. Um, and also that it's a, it's a much harder place to grow vines, so slightly shorter lived vines. Um, it's just too tough for them to live out a really long life on those schist soils. Um, now I mentioned here a little bit about schist. This is really for your reference. I'm not going to go through this too much, but in terms of its its formation, it starts life as, as mud essentially, and then under a heat and pressure, um, it, it metamorphizes, it's a metamorphic rock, uh, into slate. Uh, and then uh, and then schist and finally gneiss. Uh, so they're all part of the same family. These crystalline rocks. Um, and I think it's important to mention that you know this this part of of Saint Chinian with a lot of schist. You know there are other parts of the winemaking world that are famous. This Alsace Beaujolais, Northern Rhone, Fougere, neighbouring Fougere. Um, and then lastly, I've mentioned here Priorat. Um, and this is really my final point before we get to the t tasting, um, because. If I'm looking here to kind of sell to you or convince you, persuade you, um, because I believe in it, not just because I've been asked to, which I haven't been, by the way, I'm just here presenting some wines and hopefully giving you my take on them. But I believe that Saint Chignon, there's a lot of potential here uh, for quality and fame. Um, and I've, I believe that because I'm going to do a comparison with Priorat, which is you know fairly new to the serious uh, fine wine sector within Spain. And the story of Priorat is built around Grenache, Carignan, Mourved, uh, and then some other grapes, international grapes like Cabernet as well. But those grapes grown in a hot, dry Mediterranean climate on schist, um, and they've become collectible. And in Saint Chignon and Fougere, but we're dealing with Saint Chignon today, we are dealing with the same story. So similar grape varieties, similar climates, and then this specialist soil. Um, maybe Saint Chignon winemakers haven't realised the full potential of what they've got, but I just think it's interesting to draw a comparison there. Okay, let's taste. Uh, starting with the white, and um, this is based around limestone clay soils. Um, it's archetypal really for the whites of the region, uh, dominated by Grenache Blanc. Um, and it's, it's, a really, it's a really lovely wine. This produced Domaine de Saint-Saëns, cells rather, uh, has vineyards on both um, soil types. So it has sites on, on schist and, and then the limey, limestone clays, but it chooses the limestone clay uh, soil type for whites, feeling that it's better suited. Um, maybe that softer, richer, um, less stressed setting is better for white wines. Uh, let's taste it. Mm. And looking forward to a bit of detail on the uh, on the domain. I really like this wine. It's got real character. Uh, you draw your own conclusions, but just from tasting it now, it's peachy, it's soft, uh, it's slightly oily, uh, and then it's got these this tangy finish, I think a little bit of kind of orange, fresh orange, citrus, and saltiness, um, and almost like a very gentle bitterness. There's something, uh, it's kind of, it's between kind of Southern Rhone and almost something slightly Italianate about it, that kind of salty, slightly bitter edge to it. And of course, Vermentino being, uh, being a, a, the, the f uh, Italian name of Roll, a French grape that's grown right across the Mediterranean coast and so perfectly suited to it. And seeing that a lot in the, uh, in the Tuscan 
whites at the moment, Vermentino coming to the fore. Um, but I think, you know, a really characterful wine and something a bit different in a world where it's kind of either Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and, you know, do you either want something very crisp and, and, and linear and herbaceous or do you want something fat or, and oily? Well, here you have, you know, the two things coming together because I think it's quite a te textural, slightly peachy, you know, almost Viognier-esque style of, of white wine or ripe Chardonnay. And then it's got this um, salty, tangy edge to it, um, a bit more like uh, cool climate Sauvignon. Uh, but I think that's the Vermentino, which often gives a lot of grapefruit characters, I think, to, to white wines, even if it has the peachy scent. So there's a white from saint Chenin. So um, just one, I'm afraid. But don't forget, there are whites out there. And as this is a tiny snapshot, uh, so it's really just to tempt you to explore further. I'll be doing more on the wines of saint Chenin on the Drinks Business website, because I'm going to do a big tasting of, of, of across about 100 wines. The wines I presented to you um, <coughs> which I'm very happy to do. I w they weren't chosen by me. I was asked to present these, which is absolutely fine. I'm delighted. Uh, but uh, And, and I fully support the choices, but they weren't actually my choices. I, uh, but what I did do is when I tasted them, I didn't look up any detail on the wine or domain. I tasted them kind of semi-blind. So I didn't know what grapes I was dealing with. And I certainly didn't want to know whether it was a schist or a limestone um, uh, soil type. So then I looked across my notes and saw if I could draw any conclusions. Okay, uh, Domaine Canet Vallette, uh, respected producer in Saint Chenin. Uh, obviously, as all these are, uh, what's a thousand and one nights? Uh, here we have a sort of classic blend of the region, um, and it, this is another clay and limestone based um, terroir. And, um, and let, let's try it. Organic estate. So I think that was a really nice place to start. Not that I'm implying that it's basic, but it's just bursting with so much fruit, almost a little bit of kind of carbonic bubblegum character in there, um, but really soft, fleshy, uh, ripe, crushed strawberry. And then um, a little bit of, of, of dry mouth cleansing tannin to kind of uh, to finish it after all that sweet fruit. Um, and a lovely structure and a kind of perfect bistro wine. Um, but with character, it's got layers, hasn't it? And you can get a little bit of dried rosemary and a little bit of spice. Um, it's not a kind of one-dimensional uh, drop. And I think it's, it's, it's very pleasing, um, kind of soft and sweet on the attack and then fresh on the finish. So I like that. Um, I put in some pictures there, um, mainly just to talk about something other than the wine. Um, but I think, you know, to get a sense of this area, um, there is, uh, he's based in the, uh, in the kind of the gateway of the Parc Naturel du Haut Languedoc, so up, up quite high um, in this, in the foothills of the Cévennes, a beautiful part of France. And this is to give you an idea of what it looks like. And there's the, the river Orbe that cuts through saint Chinion, and uh, there's a bridge over it. And then in the foreground is a, is a mouflon, uh, which I had to look up. Um, um, excuse my ignorance on this. I asked a few people, I said, have you heard of a mouflon? Um, and it's the ancestor of all modern sheep breeds. And I think it's from actually from Eastern Europe, but it's been reintroduced into this part of France and it thrives here. And I think it looks rather striking there against the rocks. So that's Domaine Canet and um, I believe that he, I think I said earlier, he's organic as well. Um, so as I was saying, this is an area very well suited to organics. Um, and so I don't think it's particularly surprising that out of eight wines, at least three or four of them are, are actually certified. And if they're not, they're in conversion. And if they're not in conversion, their websites are pretty clear that they're loot raisonné, sustainable, without using herbicides, etc. cetera. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's commendable, but I also think that it's important in this area. It'd be, a, it'd be a shame in this historic wine region with uh, with such arid, pristine landscapes to start pouring herbicides into the soil. Uh, but I'm not here to preach. Okay, so our third wine, uh, Domaine Lacroix Saint Eulalie, and this is the Cuvée Baptiste. Uh, so we're from the same vintage. Um, and the blend here with a few more grapes. And it's dominated by Syrah, Carignan, Grenache, and Mourvedre. Um, and this is our first taste of schist. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe we should have just tasted it and then I should have told you afterwards, but it's out there now. Mm. 
Mm. Mm. So I think there is quite a, a step change in style there. Um, whether we want to uh, lay that at the door of the soil type or whether we want to um, lay it with the winemaker and the approach, um, I don't know. But for me, certainly, um, it's got a lot of power. It's got a lot of tannin. Um, it has got a slight angular character in a good sense. Um, and I do get that slightly pruny raisined fruit note as well. It's not hot uh, and it's not cooked fruit, but it is very ripe fruit. Um, and I think it's rather delicious, but it does have a kind of finish that whether it's the texture or the taste, I'm not sure, but a kind of stone-like character. Um, now, if you want to say that schist, then let's go with it. Uh, it's part of the story, and it's one that Saint-Chenil believe is the cause. Um, but obviously, bear in mind that there's so many factors, and this is seen maturation in, in, in barrel, um, and it may have been harvested later than the, uh, than the style that we saw in the earlier wine. Uh, obviously, a different blend, different winemaker. Um, I think they make lovely wines. Uh, it's, uh, it's a producer that's very well respected. I've got some notes on it here. Um, but they do have both soil types on the domain and uh, they say that the clay limestone tends to produce wines that are more typically longer doc, uh, which is what I was talking about earlier, they may be referring to the, the fact that you can detect the varietal character a bit more clearly or, and maybe that dried herbal aspect, um, which I don't get in this wine. I get a lot of sweet pruny fruit and, and some spice and rock, but not, uh, not, not any kind of dried herbal notes. But everyone's taste is different and maybe I've missed it. I'm not, um, could be uh, insensitive to that character. Um, but anyway, if you're into schist, uh, here's a good example of the wine style it produces. Right, number four. Uh, this is Marie de uh, Luzerda. And what's at the second step on the moon? And here we're back to uh, a, a Grenache dominant wine and it is uh, grown on clay and limestone. So we're turning our back on schist for a minute and I think it's quite nice to kind of go from, from one type to another, keep you, uh, keep you on your toes and see if we can uh, spot any differences, clear differences, and then relate them to soil. Mm. So yeah, that is a different style of wine. Um, possibly is a little bit softer, um, a little bit lighter perhaps, to get a little bit of reduction early on, but I think that seems to have cleared. Um, it is quite peppery, uh, so I suppose it's got the kind of white pepper of Grenache and some of the kind of peppers, cracked black pepper that you get as Syrah. Um, and in that sense, I suppose the, the varietal definition that Jeff had talked about from the limestone soils is certainly there. Um, and it's got a nice balance. It's not hot, it doesn't strike me as, 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 as sweet and as ripe and as alcoholic as the previous wine. Um, and it's, it's easy, it's lovely. Um, it's balanced, it's structured, it's soft, uh, and it's got plenty of character. I think it's a lovely wine. Um, I think maybe with the, uh, with the wines from limestone, there's a feeling that they're kind of a bit softer and easier and more approachable when they're young, and that maybe the wines from schist that are a bit more angular, a bit more tannic, a bit hotter maybe are um, those that that have a longer life ahead of them or are more designed for cellaring. We'll see that, we'll draw that conclusion perhaps at the end. That's a theory. Um, but yeah, I think that's a lovely wine. I think the packaging of these wines is quite fun as well and they've all got quite distinctive, memorable names, which is something I thought of just now while I'm looking at them. Um, we've gone back a vintage here as well as another point to bear in mind. Um, and again, all these wines are quite um, affordable. Uh, so this is quite high altitude, uh, but it's on the kind of limestone plateau uh, at the Ville uh, Passant uh, plateau. And, uh, and here, this example I was talking about earlier of a producer that is in fact in conversion to organics across its 24 hectares. It be, wouldn't it be wonderful if saint Chinion could not only say that it was, uh, it was a region of, uh, of two dominant soil types, but also 100% organic. Um, I think that would be a nice message. Uh, a nice easy one for the consumer, um, but maybe you don't agree. Uh, wine five. So let's take the Domaine Peche de Lune. Uh, so we've got a lot of kind of, uh, I don't know, um, connection with, uh, with the, the lunar uh, setting. I don't know why that would be, uh, but this is what um, 
fishing by the light of a moon. And uh, this is another Syrah, Grenache and Carignan blend, um, as you would expect from this part of France. And it's another wine that's grown um, with vineyards on clay and limestone soils. Mm. You know, this one struck me actually because it's got such intense, um, dense, concentrated black currant, almost cassis like fruit. Um, it tasted, I don't know, like a maybe like a Chilean Syrah. It tasted sort of new world. Um, it had a kind of density and intensity that um, I don't always associate in terms of, uh, with this part of France in terms of its kind of varietal fruit definition. But I really liked it almost, it was almost like a kind of Ribena concentrate or something, um, but delicious. So yeah, really sweet, intense, ripe black fruit. Um, and then kind of nice, dry, firm tannin, uh, but fine and ripe. And, uh, and although, you know, there's some alcohol in there, it's not hot, it's not spirity, um, it's not heavy. And I actually thought that was a really delicious wine. I thought it was layered, I thought it was balanced, I thought it was structured, I thought it was easy, um, and, uh, and with lots of personality. It's one of the things I like about the wines of saint Chignon. It's not just kind of, I don't know, another obvious Syrah tasting or Grenache, you know, it's not all about the grape variety. It's not all about just the sun. Uh, these wines seem to have a kind of personality of their own, whether it's the spice, the crushed rock, the garrigue. Uh, they're kind of, they're, they're quite complex um, and they're balanced and, and, and you're getting all of that and that soft, sweet, ripe fruit. You're getting all of that for not a lot of money. You know, you're not in, in fine wine um, territory here in terms of pricing. I made that comparison earlier with Priorat where the wines are 20 quid upwards, you know, these are between eight and, and 15 pounds. Um, you know, not much more if you think about it than a kind of Bordeaux Superior. And I don't want to knock basic Bordeaux, but it wouldn't, in my view, deliver as much juiciness, fleshiness and, and pleasure as these wines do at the same price. Um, a bit more about Domaine Peche de Lune, this Equinox, um, and here we are, it is organic. So that's nice to know. Um, fits with the theme. So, wine six, Domaine du Maturin, and this is Tango Pour Hélène. Um, I think that's to do with the fact that the owners of this estate um, are obsessed with music and all their um, wines or cuvées have some sort of music reference. And actually this wine is a little bit out of sync and that's my fault because I ordered these because we're going back to a young wine. But actually I I'm, when I taste these through again I was quite glad of that because it kind of wakes you up, refreshes the palate, shows you what a really young Saint Chignon tastes like and then we can go back to some stuff and finish with a wine at the end that's the uh, most mature of the lot. So let's have a look at this uh, gr simple Grenache Syrah blend, 60-40. Mm. Really, for me, really get the lovely, sweet, ripe, juicy, fleshy, red fruit, crushed strawberries of Grenache. And then almost it's slightly sort of like a garnacha from Spain in terms of what it makes me think of. It's almost got this kind of orange zest, this kind of little bit of freshly squeezed orange in there. Um, and then you do get some of the pepper and black fruit um, and spice and tannins and structure from the Syrah. Um, but uh, yeah, a really interesting wine. Um, it does have quite firm tannins. It is very youthful. Um, it is a bit explosive after the other wines, uh, but we're back on limestone clay. And here I am talking about um, varietal characters and the fact that they're very clear. So maybe that fits in again or supports Jefford's point about the varietal character being a bit more distinct, a bit more clear on the limestone clay soils. Um, but whatever you think, uh, I think that's a lovely, juicy, fruity, um, accessible, uh, interesting, balanced, young uh, red wine that just kind of, I don't know, cries out for a, a slice of pizza, maybe with some anchovies on it. Um, wine seven. Sorry, I keep going the wrong way. So, the, oh, Domaine uh, du Maturin is organic. Sorry, I forgot to show you that. 
Um, so it converted to organics in 2012 and in fact there's a kind of ode to organics from memory on their website um, and it's all about how if you love the region and you respect the soils then you wouldn't want to ever pour herbicide, herbicides into the ground. Um, it's, it's rather persuasive and charming uh, but you can look it up, I haven't re reproduced it here. Okay, so Wine number seven, uh, Domaine La Linquière. This is one of the producers that I kind of see hot tipped as, uh, as being one of the really respected uh, high quality domains of Saint Chignon. Um, so it's nice to be able to see its wine in here. And this, the, the Chant de Cigale, the, uh, the song of the cicadas, uh, which I think you know well from if you ever visit this part of, uh, part of uh, France or the Mediterranean, that noise. And I think it gets, it's to do with their, their legs rubbing together. They cool themselves down by kind of rubbing their limbs together. And I think that's why it's, they do it faster when it's hotter, when it's a very hot day, it can become almost deafening how intense that sound is. Um, here, this is a Syrah dominant red and we are back on schist. So let me taste it. Mm. So this wine struck me um, quite strongly, it's been quite different from the others. Um, the description from the winery I've reproduced here, um, it's an, an intense nose dominated black blackberries, black truffle, toast and spices. Um, for me, I got a strong um, floral element in this wine. I actually wonder there was a bit of Brett in there. I may be more sensitive to it. Um, but really overtly almost like peachy tea leaves and and sort of potpourri um, and then I noticed back there that he um, uses whole bunch and I wonder whether that floral component and that kind of tea leaf and some of that kind of dry tannin is from um, from whole bunch fermentations and, and incorporating the stems um, but also the very kind of soft approach that happens uh, not carbonic, but just whole bunch. Um, so I wonder whether that's quite true to the character. And then, of course, if we're talking about that, we're talking about winemaking rather than looking at the influence of the soil type. Not that it matters, but for me, that's quite a dominant character. Um, I think it's an interesting wine, and I think it's got a lot of tannin, a lot of bite. Uh, it does conform to that slightly um, firm, uh, salty, rocky, um, tannic style of wine that one or Jeff had certainly said look out for when it comes to schist. Um, but I think one of the other things, you know, that's a picture there from the domain of this very old Carignan. And I think with Carignan quite often, they, uh, the producers in this part of France use whole bunch or semi-carbonic um, just to produce a slightly softer wine style. Um, and actually the Carignan really only delivers when it's an old vine. And that gives you a sign uh, um, of what it's like there, these kind of very, very dry um, soils with very little organic matter and then these very old bush vines that are deeply rooting um, and able to grow like that in, in, without irrigation, amazing. Um, I produced here, and really for, for your reference, and, and, and do ask me at the end, in fact any questions at the end, or put them in the chat function and I'll deal with them at the end if I can. Um, but I thought it was interesting that the producer had put his own descriptions on the soil types where he grows uh, different vines because he grows it across the different terroirs of Saint Chignon and he says the shells, which the shells, the schists, um, produce fine and silky wines. Uh, the clay and limestone produce wines that are full bodied and distinctive and then the sandstones of which there are also quite a lot of stony sand, sandy soils in this region um, that give powerful tannins. I'm not sure that helps us hugely but anyway it's his descriptions and he's bothered to to demark the wine type according to the soil. He doesn't talk about grape varieties, it's quite refreshing. You know, a lot of the, the discussion that we see from the growers of Saint-Chignon isn't about Grenache and Syrah 
uh, Carignan and Sanso or whatever it is. It's about schist limestone. Um, it's about schist or sandstone, and then it's about vine age as well. Um, and I think that's an interesting difference. I think to the the winemaking and the approach in this part of the world that really is de uh, devoted or so focused on site rather than the approach that you might see more in the new world where it'd be more about variety and also I suppose varietal wines as well the region the wines from Saint Chignon are almost entire well they are always blends and I think that also adds to complexity and interest I was talking earlier about the amount of of, of la the layered nature of these wines even at a low price they deliver a lot of character and that comes as well from the fact that these are all blends um, finally the Chateau Peche Menel uh, let's taste this. Um, we are looking at all three soil types going into this, depending on where the grapes are grown, because the domain spans schist and clay limestone and sandstone. Now this is the uh, the oldest wine today, we're back in 2015, so we're tasting something a bit of bottle age. Uh, Peche Menel do like, to, this is deliberate, this isn't a, a, a library stock, they release their wines to the market after a few years bottle aging, uh, their belief being that the wines are better after time in cellar, so they kind of release them like Rioja aged for you. Um, but it's really nice to taste a serious top end Saint Chignon with a little bit of bottle age to show you uh, how well the wines um, uh, perform with a bit of time in bottle, um, a little bit of softness coming through, a little bit of some, some tertiary aromatics and characters in there. But the wines move very little, it's not tired, it's not faded, it's still got plenty of freshness, plenty of fruit and lots of structure. Um, I was really delighted to taste this wine, I'm going to look forward to, um, to finishing it later on tonight, I'll have to think about what I'm going to cook with it. There's some grilled meat um, because I think it's, it's absolutely delicious um, and I think what we're tasting here is the success of those grape varieties Syrah and Grenache grown across these soil types um, in a dry Mediterranean climate with the cooling influence of those winds to bring freshness uh, with the influence of different soil types and with the concentration and low yield and balance that comes with very old vines, so some of them are over 60 years. So I think when you put all those things together, you get a wine of that, uh, of that warmth, generosity, structure, and, uh, and character and personality. Um, it's from a high altitude rocky outcrop. Pesh means hilltop and Menel means heavens. Um, and it's, uh, it's run by these sisters, you should look them up online, I'm sorry I didn't produce a picture of them, but they look fantastic, Mary Francoise and Elizabeth, and they grew up on the estate, so they know it's inside out. Um, and it's associated absolutely no herbicides, although they're not organic. Uh, they do use carbonic maceration on the Carignan, um, and as I said earlier, they like to age the wines before release. Um, I hope you enjoy that. I mean, there is a little bit of development there. Um, it does have some slightly leather, orange zest, a little bit of smoked meat, and it's got a kind of salty, fresh finish, and then it does have that, that delicate kind of red and dark fruits, but it's not sort of sweet and juicy. Um, it is a little bit more in the angular camp, to use Jancis Robinson's description of the wines from Saint Chignon, uh, rather than the soft and fleshy, um, type that is, in terms of Jefford's conclusions, related more to limestone soils than the schist. But we know here it's a blend of different terroirs. Um, and I suppose it's hard to draw any real conclusions other than it's a really complex and delicious wine. Um, I hope I can have some questions f uh, from you. Um, if you put them in the chat function, um, then that'd be fantastic and, and someone will hand them to me uh, because I haven't got the chat function in front of me here now while I'm talking at the camera. Um, if not, then I'm very happy to receive those questions uh, via email. Uh, we can answer them at a later date. We can go back to the growers. 
we can go back to those people who look after the uh, the organization in Saint Chignon or maybe you don't have any questions maybe everything's been answered for you or maybe there are too many questions I've just opened a kind of Pandora's box um, but for me um, can you spot the differences between limestone and schist um, I don't think it's clear but I did draw some conclusions as I went along and so if I was held to the ground and my life depended on it I would say um, the wines from Schist do produce wines that may be a little bit more tannic, um, a little bit riper, more pruney and less overtly uh, soft and fruity and then the limestone sites do produce wines that maybe do show a bit more of the varietal characters that you'd associate with the Syrah and the Grenache, perhaps a bit more softness and a bit more open, a bit more expressive. Um, I think what's important is whether you go schist or calcaire is to say that uh, neither is better or worse, they're just different. And I think that's really important and it's really adding to the complexity of saint Chignon and interest because you've got two different choices there. And the other thing I would say about it is that um, you don't have to opt for one or the other because I said earlier on, um, some people and some of these winemakers, you can see they have vineyards on different soil types and they love the fact that it produces different styles of wine that then can be blended to produce something that is more complex than the base wine. Um, finally, I mean, you might be wondering, you know, after all of this, why Saint Chignon? Um, and for me, I think there are a number of reasons. Um, there's this incredible history that I touched on this, at this outset. Uh, there's the fact that it's got this amazing landscape, it's an incredible site with a Mediterranean climate. Um, it's got this very specific um, soils, set of soil types, um, and then of course you've got the grape varieties that have been cultivated in this region since Roman times. You put all those things together and you get wines, I, I believe, of personality and quality um, and an accessible price. We're not looking at very, very expensive wines here. Um, and I, the, hence my, my comparison earlier with some other French appellations where I think at similar prices you wouldn't get such warmth, generosity and complexity. Um, but I'm happy for you to prove me wrong on that. Uh, you can email me at patrickofthedrinksbusiness.com and tell me I'm talking rubbish. That's fine. I'm happy. I'm always up for a fight. Um, um, but in other words, what I would say is, is they're affordable, they're interesting, and they're authentic wines and from a beautiful part of the world. And finally, just going back to that point, that uh, comparison I drew with Priorat, which has so many similarities to Saint Chignon in terms of soil, grape variety, and climate, I think Saint Chignon is a region, a part of France, that is definitely uh, ripe for greater fame. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I won't be offended if anyone wants to log off and, and help themselves to the samples um, or get back to emails or turn to the kitchen and, and cook yourself some dinner. But if anyone has any questions, I'm hoping now that I can receive them and have a look. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, can you? T I haven't got them in front of me. Okay, so welcome back to those all, to those of you uh, who stayed online and want to hear um, about some of the questions. What's interesting is there's a bit of a theme to the questions I've received, and they've all related to the kind of market potential and personality of Saint Chignon specifically. Um, now, I don't have the answer to that question, but I can give you my opinion. But I think it's interesting that. It seems to be from the questions that you've picked up on the fact that Saint Chignon, as I said at the outset, has been kind of slightly sidelined, slightly forgotten about, and needs to rebuild awareness. And I suppose the other aspect is in rebuilding awareness, what should it focus on? Um, I'm no marketer, I think it's really. Um, 
difficult to, to, to come up with any one thing. You look at the success quite often of, of certain things in this market, whether it's Argentine Malbec, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, or aged Rioja, that it's quite a simple, memorable offer. It's quite a distinctive type of wine. It's quite consistent. There's a good base level of quality, etc., etc. Uh, but it's easy to remember, you know, in sparkling Prosecco, it's kind of one thing, isn't it? Um, but um, I think with Saint Chignon, it, it does deserve greater prominence. Uh, they are distinctive in the sense that I think Saint Chignon does have a personality uh, that is true to that particular appellation. Um, and I think that is really a, comes down to, to the, the combination, in my mind, of wines that are, are fruity and ripe and fleshy, but balanced. They're not too hot, they're not heavy, they're not tiring to drink, they're not dull. Uh, and maybe they have a kind of minerality or a herbal note, but they have a kind of generosity and then, and then balance to them. Um, and, and they're layered, they're quite complex. Um, but you know, they're kind of meaty, rich, um, generous style of, of red wine. Um, and awareness, that's the issue. How does an appellation like Saint Chignon get awareness? You know, it used to have it in the way that people used to talk about Corbière, Fitou, Minervois, uh, and Saint Chignon. They were wines that you saw in restaurant tables, you saw them in dining rooms. Um, there was a real attachment to them because they were good value and they were tasty. And I suppose as well, at the time when French wine dominated in the UK market, they were a lot richer and juicier than your inexpensive clarets. So they're a bit of a, a, a juicy kind of uh, taste of, of sunshine that wasn't all, altogether apparent. Um, but I think the choice of the region is to try and build awareness around the terroir and this idea of schist and calcaire or schist and limestone. Um, rightly or wrongly, uh, it's quite a nerdy approach, but it's, it's true, it's authentic. Um, but for me, I think Saint Chignon is a name that you should remember if you like um, fleshy, ripe styles of red with balance, uh, basically good quality reds at an affordable price. Um, and after all, you know, that's what Malbec, Argentine Malbec, has built its reputation on juicy, fruity uh, red wines at a good price that also happen to be great with steak. Well, saint Chenier are all those things. And I think with actually um, a little bit more character um, for the money, uh, certainly top end Malbec can deliver a lot of complexity and interest, but you do pay for it. So that's my view. Uh, and so one other question here, the potential for saint Chenier wine sales in the UK. Well, as I alluded to earlier, I think actually very strong. I think the, um, the British drinker has a very keen sense of value. Um, and I think um, at the lower level, the sort of eight to 12 pound market, which is quite premium anyway, there's potential to do very well for the reasons I've outlined. And then I think amongst the merchants, looking to sell slightly more expensive wines, finer wines, maybe 18 to 25 quid, um, that the opportunity for saint Chignon is to say, look, you like Priorat, you like the great reds of the Douro, um, you like the great um, wines on, 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 on schist soils from around the world, you know, try saint Chignon. You know, here is a wine that's similar in style to the great reds of Priorat, but at half the price. So I think there's potential as well at the finer um, wine element amongst um, more educated consumers to try something that's similar to a more expensive wine at a slightly lower price and uh, and will I think deliver a lot of satisfaction. So that's my view on that. Uh, any other questions I am happy to field them over email and for now thank you very much for listening. I hope you've, something, you've discovered something new if not from listening to me at least from tasting the wines and uh, please enjoy the rest of your samples. Thank you.